Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Godlasky. I'm the Director of Journalism Training for the National Press Foundation. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Fauci uh, to join us today um, for this briefing exclusively for NPF fellows. Um, as you all know, this is on the record. Um, if you need the recording afterwards, please contact Alyssa Black. Um, and we will do typical Zoom press conference etiquette, which is I will call your name. You can unmute. Uh, please say your name and your news outlet and then ask your question. Um, it will be just one question per fellow uh, because we will not have time to get to everyone. Um, and uh, with that, um, I don't want to waste any more time. So the first question uh, goes to Rachel. Hi, Dr. Fauci. Uh, this is Rachel Coors with Stat News. Um, and my question for you today is about um, variant specific vaccines. Um, FDA advisors are meeting today to talk about, you know, potentially switching to um, Omicron specific vaccines. Based on the data that you've seen, is it time to switch to new products for a fall vaccination campaign? You know, I can't answer that question, Rachel. I'll tell you why, because the, the VERPAC is looking at data that I have not yet seen. I have seen a lot of the data, but I have not seen all of the data. And I think it would not be appropriate for me to, to give you my opinion what I would do, because then knowing that they have data that I haven't seen, they'll come out with another opinion. And then bingo, you have a story, front page. You know, Fauci disagrees with VERPAC. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking, but th that's what we want to avoid. But I can tell you, the fundamental principles that will guide, and I don't know where they're going to come out. Sure. You know, when when you look at what a particular infection exposure or vaccine exposure, the, the depth and the breadth of the antibody that, that it gives you, you've got to determine what it covers on what's called an antigenic map, which is the way you look at the different variants and the coverage of the antibody is kind of like an umbrella over each of these particular variants. We have been fortunate in that the vaccine that we used against the prototype, the wild type ancestral strain, did a pretty good job of covering most of the variants that we have received when you get one more transmissible than the other. So we've gone from wild type to alpha, to beta, to delta, to Omicron, which now has four sublineages, B1, B2, BA2.1, 2.1, and now BA4, 5, that it becomes more and more transmissible and more and more removed from the original protection. So apropos of your question, what the VERPAC is looking at now is data from what happens when you boost with an Omicron alone, what kind of coverage does it give versus boosting with an Omicron hybrid with wild type? They've collected that data. Then the next question is, what happens if you boost with a B4, B5 monovalent versus a B4, B5 uh, bivalent with the ancestral? Unfortunately, there's no clinical trial data that's related to the last thing I mentioned. There's only mouse data. So what they're gonna be looking at now is to balance what you might project from mouse data that would inform your decision. Namely, are they gonna recommend only wild type, unlikely, wild type, Bivalent with an Omicron, maybe. Wild type bivalent with a B4, B5, maybe. So having not seen all the data, I myself am very interested to see after they get all the data, what their recommendation would be. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you. Brittany. Hi, yes, uh, thank you so much for your time. Brittany Johnson with KCRA. Um, just wanted to ask, do you have any concerns about the way people with long COVID are being diagnosed or treated? Well, first of all, uh, the diagnosis is still very iffy. So I don't have a concern about what's going on. I have a concern that we need to learn more about 
and get a stricter definition of what long COVID is. With regard to treatment, there is no treatment now for long COVID. So it's kind of tough to have a concern about it is that you can't treat something if you don't know what the underlying pathogenesis is. And quite frankly, we don't know what the underlying pathogenesis of long COVID. There are some hints from some studies that have been done, but nothing definitive. So we're really in a very much of a swimming in the dark a little bit with this until we get more and more information, which is the reason why, for example, in the Recover uh, uh, initiative, which is the big initiative at the NIH, that we're collecting large cohorts of people to try and find some both clinical and laboratory common denominators and then pursue a pathogenic mechanism. And once you get a pathogenic mechanism, then you can start thinking about treatment. But otherwise, it, it, it's you know, th there's no guidepost for what to treat. Thank you. Erin? Thank you so much for taking my question. This is Erin Prater with Fortune Magazine. My question is, why was herd immunity floated as a potential end game for the pandemic early in the pandemic when, as far as I'm aware, um, circulating coronaviruses other than COVID are common colds and herd immunity isn't a factor? Thank you. Well, I, I, you may have read a paper that I wrote a few months ago in JAMA about the fact that you're not gonna get herd immunity with, uh, with, with COVID for a simple reason that herd immunity presupposes a virus that does not change, that once you get uh, protection against it, that you will have either lifelong protection or protection that would require a boost, but the virus doesn't change. The big stumbling block with COVID is that history has already shown us we've had five separate variants with five separate surges and the immunity to coronaviruses is very self-limited and fleeting. So when you think of herd immunity, you think of two factors that are required. One, a virus that doesn't change much and two, immunity that's long lasting. That's the reason why you can readily get herd immunity with measles, and you can get it with smallpox, and you can get it with polio. Why? They have two characteristics or three characteristics that are very much unlike the characteristics of SARS-CoV-2. One, the virus doesn't change. The measles that was circulating 50 years ago is the same measles that's circulating now. Number two, if you get infected with measles or you get vaccinated with measles, the durability of the protection is measured in decades and likely for a lifetime. And three, there's a universal acceptance of the vaccination programs of measles, of polio, and of smallpox. For that reason, you get good herd immunity. We don't have any of those factors with COVID. So that's the reason why, as I've written, we're not gonna get classical herd immunity from SARS-CoV-2. If I can just ask a real quick follow-up, if that's okay, on the, on the same line. So I, I understand why we will not get classical herd immunity. Why do you think um, the, the possibility was even floated in the, begin, the beginning, given that you know, there are not, there's not herd immunity to other um, coronaviruses that circulate that are common colds? Well, it, well, that's a good point. It was felt that there, it was unclear that there would be so many variants, because even though there wasn't durable immunity against the original common cold viruses, they didn't change much. So there's a big difference between the four common cold coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2, which every few months you get a new variant. We didn't realize that until the variants started to evolve. Then it became eminently clear we were not gonna reach herd immunity. Thank you, Gabrielle. Hi, Dr. Fauci, thank you for doing this. Uh, my question for you is, first off, I'm Gabrielle Suttles. I'm a reporter for PolitiFact. Uh, so we deal with a lot of misinformation here. Um, so prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Had you ever dealt with health misinformation on such a broad scale before? Um, and with the misinformation that we're seeing now, you know, how has this informed your approach to how you've dealt with public communication? Well, in answer to your first question, Gabrielle, no, I've been, I've been at the NIH for over 50 years, and I've been the director of the Institute for 38 years, and I've dealt with everything from the very early years of HIV, through Ebola, through Zika, through pandemic flu, through COVID, and I've never seen anything of the magnitude of the deliberate misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories that we're seeing with COVID. It is truly unprecedented to the highest extent. What you do about that is really, you know, very unclear. It's problematic. We always say the best way to flood, the best way to counter misinformation and disinformation is to do as best as you can to flood the system with correct information. However, it, it appears um, almost diabolical or paradoxical that the energy that people put into spreading misinformation and disinformation is greater than the energy of people who have a day job is in putting out correct information. You know, it seems that there are people who do nothing but put out incorrect information. And the people who have the correct information have other things to do with themselves. And they're not constantly out there beating the bushes with correct information. It's a problem that is very, very difficult to solve. And I really worry about the future when we have now lived in an environment where we have what's called the normalization of untruths, that there's so much nonsense, misinformation and untruths there that society tends to shrug their shoulders and say, nothing is true. I mean, anybody can say anything and with social media, it gets a life of its own. And after a while, the general public can't figure out who's telling the truth and who's not. That's a very difficult situation for our society to be in, but it seems we're sinking deeper and deeper into that. Thank you. Laura? Hi, Dr. Fauci. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Laura Duclos. I'm with the Houston Chronicle. Um, I had to write down my question. Uh, so just one second. Um, with so many at-home COVID tests available, what, if anything, is the government doing to improve tracking those infection rates? And how will the public know the level of virus transmission with inaccurate case data? That's a very good question. And there's no real answer to that. What I believe should be is that there should be some easy way, an app, or something that when someone gets an antigen test that's positive, gets mild symptoms and doesn't come to the attention of a physician, that there's an easy way to report that to a central data bank. But there's not. And I'm disappointed in that, that there's not. Because even though the last count yesterday was something like 100,000 cases, there were probably five times that amount that actually, or three times, I don't know what a number is, I'm just guessing, but it's certainly an undercount because I'll bet everybody on this Zoom call knows people who have tested positive but never reported it to anybody. I did have a second portion though. Um, I'm not sure if this is a strictly COVID talk, but I just wanted to know your thoughts on the WHO's assertion that monkeypox, the monkeypox outbreak does not constitute a public health emergency of international concern. Um, anything on that? No, I mean, that's, there's almost like a little bit of a semantics to that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't rest my attention to an outbreak based on whether somebody defines it as a public health emergency of international concern. I think we have a problem here. We're facing an outbreak, a global outbreak in non-endemic countries. We don't have a handle on whether there's subclinical spread that we're missing because there's not enough testing going on. So, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's a problem that we really better address because you know it's, it grows and grows, and that's all of a sudden how things get out of hand. William? Hey, Dr. Fauci, this is Will Newton with Clinical Trials Arena. Um, given the many different ways that long COVID presents, 
what are some of the biggest challenges to selecting outcome measures and long COVID trials? And to what extent do you believe they should be standardized? Well, they absolutely have to be standardized. Long COVID is a very heterogeneous constellation of signs and symptoms that vary from people to people. Some of the real common denominators are rather substantial exercise-induced exhaustion and fatigue. The other things vary from person to person, temperature dysregulation, dysautonomia, sleep disturbances, mental cognitive problem, which they call brain fog. That's one of the reasons, uh, William, why we created this very, very large cohort of people to try and see if there are some truly common denominators and can we pinpoint any pathogenic mechanism associated with that in order to get to the question that one of you asked me a few minutes ago is what about treatment? You can't do anything about it if you don't know what's causing it. So that's the reason for the large number of people in the cohort. Jimena? Thank you so much for the time. My name is Jimena Bustillo. I'm with NPR. Are you playing any sort of role in the planning of the White House Conference on Hunger and Nutrition, especially since there has been such an explicit tie between COVID and diet-related diseases? Well, the simple answer to that is no. Uh, I'm not involved in the planning of that conference. So, sorry. Are you hoping that they'll touch on the tie between COVID and diet-related diseases? Well, you know, I'm not sure. When, when you say, what, what do you have in mind when you say COVID and diet related diseases? I'm, I'm trying to connect the dot here. What, 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 what did you have in mind? Yeah, 100%. Multiple members of the Biden administration, especially the agriculture secretary and Biden himself have noted that those who were more likely to get COVID as well as suffer worse impacts of COVID, uh, stronger symptoms, higher rates of hospitalization or long COVID tended to be those that may have been obese or suffer of other forms of diet related. Oh, good, yeah, yeah, good point. No, that's, uh, that's good now that you clarify that. Yeah, one of the real problems that we don't know why that connection is, but one of the strongest connections to COVID severity is obesity. And in fact, to our surprise, a recent paper came out that said not only do obese people have a greater likelihood of suffering a severe consequence of COVID, but they have a greater likelihood of getting COVID to begin with which has got to get unpacked and sorted out because there's got to be a lot of confounding variables in that. But your point is well taken. And even like, I mean, people who are undernourished and immune compromised because of that have a greater, a greater chance of getting a severe outcome. So in that respect, it is related to dietary related issues. Dan, are you ready for us? Uh, I'm Daniel Rocher. I'm with the Kansas City Star. Uh, a few months ago, you uh, were in a hearing and you called Kansas Senator Roger Marshall a moron. Uh, I was wondering with hindsight, how do you feel about that comment? But I, also the larger question of what has it been like navigating the politics of Congress in particular in this pandemic get, or compared to say like the HIV AIDS pandemic that you had to deal with you know, politicians in the past? Well, I don't want to resurrect that that hearing for anybody because I think it's best laid low. I didn't directly say that to him. I mumbled something to myself under the, my breath. There's a little bit different than publicly calling someone something that was not meant to be heard. But if you look at the circumstances of it, would you go back since you asked the question and take a look at what antedated my mumbled comment to myself? He started off by showing a posted, a post, a, 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 a placard of my government salary. And one would ask, what the hell does my government salary have to do with an oversight hearing? I don't determine my salary. The government determines my salary. The next question that he asked was a strong inference that I was in bed with pharmaceutical companies. And that's the reason why I did not allow my financial statement to be publicly available. 
one, my financial statement is totally publicly available. And B, why would you infer publicly at a hearing on television that I was in bed with the pharmaceutical companies when the fact is I have never taken a single cent from the pharmaceutical company? That was the reason why I made the comment to myself. I wasn't making it publicly. <laughs> and your second question? <laughs> well, I, I mean, you kind of spoke to it, but kind of the difference in navigating the politics in this pandemic than what you've had to deal with in the past, you know, say like during the HIV AIDS pandemic and, and how they are interacting, the politicians are interacting with you in a way. Well, it's totally different because back then where the, for example, the pushback on the part of activists of which was, I think, one of my finest hours because I reached out to the activist community. The difference between then and now is that, for example, the, the tension between the activist community and now was really based on the fact that they very much um, were saying things that were reasonable and needed to be addressed, the lack of attention and the lack of resources that were being put into um, uh, HIV, and their confrontation was to gain our attention, which we didn't give them. And when I started to listen to what they were saying, I became convinced that what they were saying is very, very true and needed to be addressed. What we're dealing with now is a deliberate distortion of reality and what I call the normalization of untruths. I mean, there's so much nonsense going on. I've never seen anything like it. And, you know, in getting back to your question um, early on about the hearing, there was never any impugning of my integrity or, or anything. It was always a question of a disagreement with the policy. When what you referred to a little while ago at the hearing was a direct, unprovoked impugning of my integrity which I resented and responded accordingly. Jennifer? My name is Jennifer Solis. I'm a reporter for the Nevada Current. So state and local officials across Nevada signed an agreement with North Shore Clinical Labs, a COVID uh, testing laboratory that missed 96% of positive cases, um, you know, according to an investigation by ProPublica. The company also collected uh, nearly 165 million from the federal government. Uh, you know, what kind of oversight do these agreements that receive federal money have? You know, what's being done at the federal level to prevent ineffective labs like this one from getting these contracts? I can't answer that question. That's totally out of my lane. I'd wind up getting in trouble doing that. So that's something that I just don't deal with. So I'd rather not comment on it. Okay, Kirk. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for being here. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, question for you here. Congress has reached a stalemate on the latest round of COVID funding. The White House has had to reallocate uh, the available funds to make new vets scenes for the fall. What does this mean for COVID response at the current moment? And what concerns do you have about the future with this lack of money right now? Well, I and my colleagues on the coronavirus team, uh, you know, from the White House down are very concerned about uh, the lack of responsiveness to our needs to both develop and distribute countermeasures in the form of vaccines, drugs, and tests, as well as the lack of resources to continue to do some of the research that's necessary to well position us for the inevitability of future pandemics, as well as to improve upon the countermeasures that we already have. So it really is a very serious problem. I don't want to uh, belittle the fact that the Congress up to now has been extremely generous, giving us a lot of money. So it is not that we're not appreciative of the large amount of money that has already been given to us, but we are still in the middle of a war here against a very formidable virus and to all of a sudden stop 
funding at a time when we need it, you know, is really disconcerting to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question for you, Dr. Fauci here. What, you know, you've been very visible in the administration's COVID response. And in fact, I cover campaigns and it's really been shocking to see how prominent you are in some of these attack ads for some of these Republicans right now. Like I think there was an ad that had a villains meeting and you were in this sort of AA thing with the Joker, Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Satan. Does that, how does that, what is your reaction to being so politicized in this campaign season? And has that impacted how you do your job at all or go about your job? Well, the answer to your second question is no. Um, you know, because I originally, during the Trump administration, had, I believe, if you want to call it that, it is the truth, I had the courage to stand up and have to contradict the president when I took no great pleasure in that. Mm -hmm. I don't like, I have a great deal of respect for the presidency of the United States, and I don't like to have to get up publicly and contradict something he said. And there were many things he said early on that I had to for the sake of preserving my own integrity, as well as my responsibility to the American public. And I feel a very deep responsibility to the American public. I'm a public service, I'm a physician, I'm a scientist, and I'm a public health official. That triggered a phenomenal amount of enmity against me on the part of the very far right Trump people. And even after he left now, I have become, as I am, the symbol of some people, you know, it's a big dichotomy. Mm -hmm. For a great proportion of the population, I've become symbolic of truth and integrity and telling thing as it is. And for another portion of the population, I've been public enemy number one in which they politicize me and use me in campaign ads. I mean, I you saw me bring that out at a hearing uh, when Rand Paul was accusing me of outlandish things. I showed up his website that said fire Fauci and underneath it, you can donate 10, 20, 100, 200, $300 to my campaign. I mean, is that is that a way to handle a public health emergency? I don't think so, but that's what it is. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, for doing this. Um, so as you just mentioned, under President Trump, there was considerable pressure um, to downplay COVID, to offer alternative treatments that wouldn't actually treat it. Um, and you stuck to the scientific facts at the time. But you've talked about retiring um, you know, in the near future. So what is there anything that you can do to ensure your replacement um, you know, doesn't succumb to political pressure if there is a new administration that doesn't stick to the scientific mainstream? What can you do to ensure the, the NIH can do that? Well, you know, I, I, George Stephanopoulos asked me about, you know, I'm 81 years old. He said, you know, you've been this at a long time. When do you retire? And I said, well, I will someday. And all of a sudden that became news, <laughs> you know, that, that, that I was retiring. So the only thing I can say, I can guarantee you, Victoria, that I will retire before I die. <laughs> so uh, I, I tend to do that. Uh, I, I intend to do that. Uh, but, you know, my replacement, I hope my replacement would, would use me as an example of why it's so important to stick by the truth, no matter what the, the forces they're pushing back against it. I have confidence that there are enough competent people around that when I do leave, when that happens, that I'll be replaced by somebody that would still do a really good job. I, I don't worry about that. There are a lot of good people in public health. And we are at 4.30. And Dr. Fauci, I know that you uh, had a had a hard stop, um, but I wanted to thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, and uh, fellows, if you could just hang on for a second, but Dr. Fauci, thank you so much. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Good luck. Take care now. Bye. Thank you.